welcome down, everyone, to the British Library. And uh, thanks for braving the heat to join us tonight and to all of those who are joining us online. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Lucy Freeman Sandler for her lecture entitled Golden Books as part of a series accompanying the exhibition Gold, 50 Spectacular Manuscripts from Around the World which is now on at the British Library just downstairs until the 2nd of October. I'm Kathleen Doyle, the lead curator of Illuminated Manuscripts here at the library and one of the curators of the Gold Exhibition. Lucy is the Helen Gould Shepherd Professor Emerita of Art History at New York University, where she was chair of the department until 2003. I hope Lucy won't mind me saying that um, she's been studying and thinking about manuscripts for around 70 years, and so she's one of the world's leading experts on Western, European, and in particular English illuminated manuscripts. Her list of publications and invited lectures runs to 15 pages, so you'll be relieved I'm not going to be reading that out to you tonight but many of you will be familiar with her seminal work on English 14th century manuscripts, Gothic manuscripts 1285 to 1385, as well as monographs on the Omnum Bonum, uh, the Peterborough Psalter, the Delisle Psalter, and the uh, Ramsey Psalter. I can see from the audience that I'm not alone in seeing Lucy as a real inspiration in so many ways, and as a model for a productive ret retirement, as seven books and numerous pages of the 15 of the articles date from after 2003, including illuminators and patrons in 14th century England, the Psalter and Hours of Humphrey de Boone, and the manuscripts of the Boone family, published by the British Library in 2014. During lockdown, when many of us were struggling to get out of our pajamas, Lucy researched and wrote her latest book, uh, Penned and Painted, The Art and Meaning of Books in Medieval and Renaissance Manuscripts, published in May, and she'll be signing copies of her books after the lecture tonight, just downstairs by the bookstore, where you can acquire one for her to sign. Penned and Painted is written for a general audience, in which Lucy includes an introduction followed by succinct one-page analyses of 60 British Library manuscripts, illustrated by full-color illustrations. Lucy included some of the most famous British Library manuscripts in her book and featured several that you will have seen or will see, I hope, in the Gold Exhibition. And about every week when we were at home, during lockdown, Lucy would send me an entry. And I remember often thinking, she can't possibly find anything new to say about this manuscript. And every time, Lucy would surprise me with discoveries from close looking and her erudite, thoughtful, insightful, and beautifully written text. And I say without American hyperbole, that it is truly a wonderful book. Lucy's talk tonight will be drawn in part from her work on penned and parchment, but I know that she's written this lecture specifically to address some of the issues raised in the Gold Exhibition, in particular the varied uses, function, and meaning of gold in illuminated manuscripts. Her lecture will be about 45 minutes, and then Lucy will take about 15 minutes of questions. If you'd like to ask a question and you're here with us in the entrance hall, raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. And if you're listening online, you can participate too by using the question box just below the video. Now please join me in giving Lucy a warm welcome to the British Library.
Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Kathleen for such a lovely introduction, and I want to thank the British Library for asking me to give this talk, and I want to thank the whole staff of the Department of Manuscripts for many years of help, uh, and in particular, uh, Callum uh, Coburn uh, for his help with the pictures that I'm going to show tonight. When I mentioned to a friend that I was going to give a lecture about golden books, she said immediately, oh, little golden books. This is the cover of one of the earliest little golden books, uh, published first in 1942. It's a series that's still going on today. The only vestige of material gold or gold color is, as you can see, at the edge of the spine. But when I thought of other associations of gold and books that are still current, I called to mind my own copy of the Bible, neatly bound in black leatherette, stamped in gold on the cover, and with golden foredges. The gilding of the edges of the pages of the Holy Scriptures is an ancient tradition. Those of you who've seen the British Library exhibition won't have found any tangible examples on show, however, because for the most part, manuscript leaves have been clipped, just as most manuscripts have been rebound many times. But representations of books in manuscripts like the one here on the right, often show the bulk of the pages between the covers as golden, suggesting the precious both materially and conceptually. This is just one of the many ways that we can talk about books as golden. My aim today is to explore with you the visual ramifications of the phrase golden books and to think out loud about what <clears throat> to think out loud about what the multiplicity of uses of gold in manuscripts of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance meant to their commissioners, makers, and users. Because we're here in the British Library, almost all my examples will come from the fabulously rich collection of this institution. I have to begin with some disclaimers. This is not a talk about techniques of gold application. I'll be dealing with end results, with effects, so to speak, and I leave precise descriptions of the, uh, of the processes of making and employing gold to experts on the craft of illumination, a craft nicely demonstrated, by the way, in a video in the gold exhibition. And also, I'm going to limit the range of my talk to manuscripts produced during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Western European and the Eastern Mediterranean world. Like many of you who've seen the British Library exhibition, I've been simply amazed by the golden treasures from far away India, Indonesia, Iran, Japan, Myanmar, Tibet, and Turkey. But like an old shoemaker, I'm sticking to my last, and the kinds of manuscripts about which I can claim any familiarity are those produced in Western Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean between the 6th and the 16th century. Let's begin simply with depictions in manuscripts of things that are actually gold or gold-colored in the real world. Apart from the symbolic meaning of gold, which we'll come to in a while, gold has always been considered as materially precious, and medieval illuminators used gold leaf, gold paint, or gold-colored paint to represent valuable things made of gold. First, of course, is monetary gold, mined in the form, minted in the form of coins. The picture you're looking at is one remarkable example uh, in a manuscript 
produced in Genoa in the 1330s, and I included a discussion of this miniature in my book. Uh, the volume contains a treatise on the seven deadly sins that was commissioned by a Genoese merchant of the Coccarelli family for the moral, educational, and civic education of his son. This miniature illustrates usury, a subdivision of the vice of avarice, by showing the interior of a pawn shop with the pawnbroker making an offer to a client for a now tarnished silver object. On the table in the front are piles of gold coins. Like the 14th century Genovini, uh, Genovino, which you see on the right. Uh, to, the coins are to be given, of course, in exchange for the deposits. Off to one side is the clerk who's recording the transaction, and hanging on the wall in the background are objects that have already been pawned, all gold. Among them, as you can see, a gold sword, two gold belts, a gold ewer, a gold plate, and a gold ciborium. The depiction of real gold, real gold coins, leads us to the much more common representation in manuscripts of gold coins that have a symbolic meaning in Christian terms. When the three magi came to venerate the newborn Christ child, they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In manuscript illustration, the gift of gold was often shown in the form of gold coins. As we see here, this is the early 14th century English Queen Mary Psalter. It's open in the exhibition, but to another page. Here, the container of the gold coins is a golden ciborium, the liturgical vessel used to hold the, uh, sacra the sacramental Eucharistic wafers of the mass. So the golden coins given by the king can also be understood symbolically as the offering of the body of Christ and the kneeling figure as the priest who makes the offering at mass here blessed by the Christ child himself. As we can see here, manuscript images were and can often be read in multiple ways, one meaning enriching another. Now I'm going to focus on the uses of gold in manuscripts where the precious metal does signify more than material riches and has a symbolic meaning. Let's start with manuscripts themselves written in gold. Here's a magnificent book open to this page in the exhibition. The manuscript was produced around 800 under the patronage of the Emperor Charlemagne and it's famous today as a golden gospels. Every word of the text is written in gold and each page, as you see, is framed like a precious object with a protective pattern gold border. Gold here, of course, is equated with the holy scriptures, the sacred word of God, the creator and ruler of the universe. In the Middle Ages, gold was also considered as the appropriate vehicle for writing texts relating to secular rulers, whose rule in the medieval way of thinking was sanctioned by the deity. Here, for example, is a page with a detail of the last lines from the charter presented in 966 by the Anglo-Saxon King Edgar to Newminster Winchester on the occasion uh, of the Newminster's refoundation as a Benedictine abbey. This part of the text that you're looking at concerns the king's benevolent intentions and the detail includes the Latin words for our kingdom. The generous gifts of the king uh, are worthy of being described in valuable gold script. Now, now here, oh, we've switched, we have to go back. 
there. <clears throat> now here is another case of the use of gold script in connection with earthly rule. We're looking at a page from a slim picture book with miniatures of the kings of England from the time of Edward the Confessor in the 11th century to Edward I, who reigned from 1270, 1270 to 1307. The manuscript was, this manuscript was produced between 1280 and 1300 while Edward I was still alive. Each picture, except for that of Edward, is accompanied by a short account of the life of the ruler written in various arrangements of gold and blue script, as you can see here in the miniature that shows Henry III. Henry is shown as the patron builder of Westminster Abbey, a model of which he holds on his lap. The Anglo-Norman text below, in alternating lines of blue and gold, begins with a line in gold saying, after, quote, after, after John, his son Henry III, ruled for 16 years. And I think the detail gives a good idea of the brilliant polish of the golden letters literally glorifying the name Henry. Golden letters were often greatly enlarged at the beginning of manuscript texts. The New Minster Charter that we just saw uh, has a striking example, a page uh, which begins with the overlapping Greek letters chi and rho for the name Christ, a monogram that looks like XPI at the start of the phrase quote, Christ, all-powerful author of the whole fabric of creation, which is written in large golden capitals. Another monogram is shown in the exhibition, as you can see here um, on the right. Uh, it comes at the beginning of a long document composed in 1395 by a courtier of Charles VI, King of France, addressed to Richard II, King of England, pleading for peace between the two nations and for a joint crusade in the name of Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice for humankind is uh, underscored by the crown of thorns radiating golden rays over the crowns of France and England. <clears throat> In the main section of the miniature, the golden letters YHS for Jesus are projected against a heraldic background of gold French fleur-de-lis and gold English lions. On the facing page, a miniature which I reproduce in my book shows the presentation of this very work to Richard II. The miniature is painted above the textual prologue written in alternating lines of gold, red, and blue. The entire ensemble uses gold pictorially and textually as both sacred and royal symbol, and even includes a portrait uh, of the manuscript itself on the right, showing it as covered in a binding richly decorated with gold. Now, among the dazzling manuscripts in the gold exhibition is the Psalter of Melisende, queen of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, painted in Jerusalem around the middle of the 12th century. The page shown is the enlarged initial B for Beatus, blessed, the beginning of Psalm 1, blessed is the man who hath not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. Here, as you can see, the entire image is golden, figural and decorative motifs and background as well. The elements of the design are outlined in black as if engraved in metal, and some details are picked out in white. King David, traditionally the author of the Psalms, appears in the lower part of the letter, seated and playing his harp. All the other figural elements in the initial, that is the fantastic animals and the birds, are ensnared in the stylized foliage. But David is free of these entanglements, his prominence visually evoking his importance as a ruler, an ancestor, and even an Old Testament figure of Christ himself. 
In medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, gold was used not only to enhance the value of the text and initial letters, but also to surround the text with rich borders. One example of which we've already seen. Later in the Middle Ages, such borders often consisted of golden foliage For instance, small-scale stylized leaves on curving black stems that form a sparkling network scrolling across the surface of the page. I might mention here that the surfaces of manuscript pages are rarely completely flat and certainly curve when the pages are turned, so the effect of gold is usually enhanced when books are actually handled but decreased in most documentary photographs, as you may have noticed in the slides I'm showing today. The example we're looking at here is from a psalter made in the early 15th century for a prince of France and given to King Henry VI of England. Every one of the text pages of the book, more than 500 of them, was treated in the same labor-intensive way literally illuminating the word of God with gold. The latest development in the use of gold in the borders of manuscript pages was illustrated in the exhibition with this early 16th century French Renaissance book of hours, an extraordinary example of the mesmerizing trompe l'oeil representation of details of the natural world. Here, flowers and insects casting shadows against the muted sheen of the gold background. In the age when printed books were becoming increasingly common, this handwritten and hand-illuminated manuscript for a connoisseur of the art of illusion evokes the sheer wonder of God's creation. Let's move on now from borders to manuscript images themselves. Where's gold used in pictures? First, we'll look at gold in the setting or background. Such large areas of gold are the artistic equivalent of light, light from the sun or from the deity. This uh, on the screen now is a page from, a Greek lang from the Greek language Bernie Gospels, uh, it's a miniature painted in Constantinople, that is Istanbul, in the 12th century. The manuscript is in the exhibition, uh, open to a miniature of St. Mark, but I'm showing you a page that I illustrated in my book. It's the evangelist John turning his head to hear the voice of God and dictating his gospel to a scribe. The background of the figures and the rocky landscape is a shimmering expanse of gold, identifying the space and the event as sacred, filled with the light of God. Medieval illuminators devoted a great deal of attention to gold backgrounds, often to heighten the interplay between actual light um, and shining metal, they incised patterns that enliven the surface of the page. Uh, here's an example from the exhibition, uh, a detached leaf uh, showing the Annunciation from a Psalter of around 1200 that was produced in Flanders. The background is tooled with finely incised linear spirals and stylized foliage, overlaying the gold of the heavenly and the eternal with allusions to the earthly, the temporal of the natural world. A similar treatment of the background appears in one of my all-time favorite manuscript images, which I couldn't resist showing today. The Virgin and Child of the Swalter of Robert de Lille, painted in London in the first decade of the 14th century. Here, the five-pointed leaves in the elaborate pattern incised into the gold ground are silhouetted against fields of closely spaced dots, I think introducing a sense of oscillation, not only across the surface, but from the front to the back. We could almost say that 
uh, the pattern is a kind of visual metaphor of the ever-changing motion or movement of the universe. Now there's time to show one more variant of the treatment of gold backgrounds. This is the use of shaped metal punches to tool gold leaf grounds. That is to create regular rather than freehand patterns. The background of this page from the Golden Haggadah, which is in the exhibition, provides my example. The manuscript was made in Barcelona in the 1320s. Here, the pattern is composed of a diagonal linear grid uh, ruled with a pointed instrument, punctuated uh, by star-like punched motifs at the intersections. The Golden Haggadah contains a service that takes place in Jewish households at Passover, marking the freeing of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. The page you're looking at has four scenes from the lives of Jacob and Joseph, events mentioned in the book of Genesis. And the detail shows Joseph's two dreams. First, that his sheaf of corn would stand upright while those of his 11 brothers would lower themselves. And second, that the sun and moon and 11 stars, which you perhaps can see in the picture, uh, that, uh, they would, that they would worship him, that is, Joseph. These are dreams of God's favor or favoritism, which arouse the anger of Joseph's father and brothers, and that's depicted in the lower right-hand section of the whole page. As in Christian manuscripts, the gold backgrounds are equated with the sacred, here with the sacred history of God's relation to the Israelites of the Old Testament. Gold in the backgrounds uh, that we've been looking at is not a representation. It is simply put, put a visual witness of the presence of light with all its attendant meanings. But light was also represented in medieval manuscripts using gold. Here uh, is, to me, a breathtaking example from a biblical manuscript of the type called a Bible Historial, a history Bible, written in French and illustrated in Paris in the early 15th century. We remember that at the beginning of the book of Genesis, God said, quote, let light be made, quote, and quote, saw that the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. So in this miniature, at God's command, the pale golden light of the upper hemisphere illuminates the blue sky above, and the black below casts the surrounding area into darkness, God's work on the first day of creation. More often, light was represented in the, uh, in the form of its source in our cosmos, that is, the sun and gold was regularly used to depict the sun and its radiance. No. This example is from a Hebrew manuscript, um, uh, another Hebrew manuscript, a miscellany compiled in northern France over a period of time from the late 13th to the early 14th century. The miniature shows, as the Hebrew caption says, quote, the sun and the moon and stars within the wheel. The term wheel evidently related to the idea of the rotational movement of the spheres of the universe. In a circle, which is the conventional medieval visualization of the spherical shape of the universe, uh, we can see uh, the gold sun with curving rays, a crescent moon, and the small gold disks of the stars against a deep blue background. Another brilliant example is this illustration of the 14th century Italian poet Dante's Divine Comedy for one of the cantos of Paradise, the final section. Uh, the miniature, this miniature was painted in the 1440s by the famed Sienese artist Giovanni di Paolo. I discuss actually a different paradise miniature in my book, but the one we see here shows the journey of Dante and his companion Beatrice 
toward the fourth sphere beyond the Earth. In medieval cosmology, it's called the heaven of the sun. The blazing golden rays of the sun in the center beam down on the terrestrial landscape below. For Dante, the heaven of the sun was the realm of the souls of wise human beings enlightened by the message of the Christian deity. So the sun and its rays here can be understood as a symbol of God bestowing his wisdom on the earth and its human inhabitants. Golden rays, like those here, have multiple meanings in medieval imagery, but most often they symbolize the third person of the Christian trinity, the Holy Spirit. And two of the main pictorial subjects where the rays appear, golden rays appear, are the Annunciation and the Pentecost. Here's a 14th century Florentine miniature of the Annunciation. It's a cutting uh, from a choir book used in the mass, and, it's in the ex and this page is in the exhibition. There's a brilliant gold leaf background against which the lushly ornamented initial letter R is displayed, encircling a scene of the Annunciation, the appearance of the angel Gabriel to tell the Virgin that the Holy Spirit will, quote, come upon her and she will conceive a son. In the upper part of the composition, the Lord sends down the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove flying on fine linear golden rays which pass over the middle of the initial. And if you look very hard on the far right, you might be able to see this tiny white bird approaching uh, the, the dove of the Holy Spirit, approaching the head of the Virgin Mary. Now here are two miniatures of the Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit that inspired the apostles to preach the gospel. On the left is a detail from the 12th century Winchester Psalter, where we see flame-like golden rays descending from the dove of the Holy Spirit uh, in the gold, uh, to the gold-haloed heads of the apostles, who themselves are wearing gold-bordered garments. Gold is the vehicle of the Holy Spirit, and the transmission of the Holy Spirit to the apostles is underscored by the profusion of gold in the delineation of their robes. Uh, now there on the right is a majestic and serene Pentecost with the Virgin Mary in the center. The miniature is a detached leaf from a book of hours of the very end of the 15th century that was illustrated in Tours, France, by the well-known artist Jean Bourdichon. Here, the Pentecost scene is viewed close up, almost as if we're right there in the circle of apostles. The golden rays are thin beams of light emanating from a sun-like circular aura, a kind of halo around the dove of the Holy Spirit. The aura of the holy was codified in the Middle Ages in the form of the golden halo, as we can see in these two Pentecost miniatures, in the one solid gold discs, in the other transparent gold outlined circles. Along with golden halos, other sacred symbols of the deity are often represented in gold. The idea of God's dominion over the entire universe is visualized in images called Christ in Majesty, where the Lord holds a golden orb, as we see here, this is a 12th century English manuscript known as the Shaftesbury Psalter. Such images ultimately descend from ancient Roman imperial portraits as they're reflected in medieval pictures of emperors, uh, such as this famous image of the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III, painted around the year 1000. And this is one picture that, uh, from a manuscript that's not in the British Library, but in the State Library of Munich. Another golden symbol of the deity, aside from the orb, beside the orb, is the chalice. If the golden orb alludes to the Lord as ruler of the universe, the chalice refers to the Lord as sacrifice for the sake of humankind. 
In the Christian mass, the sacramental wine in the chalice is uh, changed to the blood shed by Christ at the crucifixion. Here in the Psalter of Robert DeLille, a manuscript I mentioned before, old Adam, the first man, the original sinner, holds a chalice, holds up the chalice uh, containing the blood that's being shed by his redeemer, Christ, who was called the new Adam. The Eucharistic chalice itself <clears throat> was venerated and represented in gold, as we see here in two examples. The left is a miniature illustrating the reading for the Feast of Corpus Christi, that's the body and blood of Christ, in a mass book completed around 1508 on the commission of a mayor of London, his name was Stephen Jennings. And on the right, another golden chalice the opening illustration of a register of all the names of the members of the Guild of Corpus Christi of Boston, Lincolnshire, as of the 1460s. Even more fundamental than the chalice as a Christian symbol is the cross itself. And while the cross of the crucifixion was often represented in manuscripts as wooden, tan, or brown, or sometimes green, as a, as a symbol of the Christian faith itself, it was frequently represented in gold. Here, uh, for example, is a modest historiated initial at the beginning of the 13th century uh, copy of a treatise on the virtues and vices per perhaps produced in France, uh, showing a personification of faith as a woman holding a disc with a golden cross, a golden chalice, and a golden orb. The lower section of the initial has the opposing vice uh, identified there as idolatry and a pictorial example uh, showing a man worshiping a monstrous idol. The cross is the Christian symbol par excellence. Now here is a full page cross where gold is a brilliant yellow pigment. This is a 10th century image from a Spanish book of readings from the mass. As you can see, hanging from the arms of the cross are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha and Omega, referring to Christ's words in St. John's apocalyptic vision, I am the beginning and the end. The inscription at the bottom of the page, again in bright yellow equivalent of metallic gold, and also continued in now dulled silver, says, quote, the sign of the cross of Christ the King. In the Christian liturgy, the cross stands on, an, on, uh, on or above the altar. So here are two pictures of golden crosses in situ. On the left is a miniature commemorating the gift around the year 1031 of a golden cross to the Church of Newminster, Winchester by the Danish conqueror, King Knut, uh, and his consort, El, El Gifu. Uh, and on the right is a Parisian miniature of around 1440 to 50, showing members of the worldwide Christian community adoring a giant bejeweled golden cross on the altar of a chapel. The setting and the two-armed shape refer to an altar cross of a chapel erected in Jerusalem over the site of the crucifixion, which was only a distant memory in the Middle Ages. But the gold material and the rich array of jewels recalls reliquaries made throughout the period to house fragments of what was the relic of the true cross. As it happens, both of these manuscripts that I'm showing here appear in my book. And the 15th century image, no, the 15th century image is from a book of hours that was used for the cover of my book, which Kathleen showed you before, um, on which we see St. Luke the Evangelist in his study, surrounded by books. 
whether the giant size of the reliquary cross in the Parisian miniature records the dimensions of an actual object, we don't know. Certainly the gold material and the large scale underscore its symbolic importance. Like this cross, other containers of sacred relics were depicted in manuscripts as golden. Here's an example from a Psalter made in England in the second quarter of the 15th century. The initial for the psalm that begins, Sing to the Lord a New Song, shows David crowned in gold with his golden harp adoring the golden Ark of the Covenant containing the Ten Commandments. The historical, biblical basis for the use of gold here is the detailed description of the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament book of Exodus. From the time of Moses, the Ark was carried by the Israelites in all their wanderings until fin uh, finally David brought it to Jerusalem. As the Book of Kings says, and our picture shows, quote, with joyful shouting and sound of trumpets. Now here are two, cont uh, two contemporary uh, uh, English images of another golden shrine. The, uh, uh, this time that of a Christian saint, the martyred ninth century East Anglian kid Edmund, whose perfectly preserved body was venerated at Bury St. Edmunds, a major pilgrimage destination in the Middle Ages. From Christmas 1433, to Easter 1434, King Henry VI even stayed at the Abbey of St. Edmunds, a visit commemorated in the miniature on the left, which shows him worshiping at the golden shrine of St. Edmund, which was encrusted with jewels and precious marbles. With some variations, St. Edmund's shrine appears repeatedly in this manuscript, whose text is the verse account by the contemporary Barry Monk, John Lydgate, of the life and veneration of the saint. The picture on the right shows the author himself praying at the shrine. I'd like to turn now to the representation to gold in the representation of human figures. Sometimes gold is used for precious metal ornaments such as crowns, collars, belts, or richly woven or embroidered garments. But here, as we've seen before, gold can have a symbolic meaning, referring to earthly power and sacred dominion. <clears throat> In the exhibition is this miniature from a ninth century Psalter named for the Carolingian Emperor Lothar, where the entire image of the ruler has been transformed into a golden ornament studded with pearls, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, from his crown to the brooch at his shoulder, to his sword, and even to the cushion under his feet. I'm showing a detail of Lothar, along with a bejeweled ninth century Carolingian reliquary, the so-called talisman of Charlemagne, meant to protect its original female owner, uh, and display her religious devotion in material form. It's the same purpose as Lothar's fictive garment. The Lothar Psalter also includes a miniature of David playing the kind of stringed instrument called a cithara in the Book of Psalms. He's shown as a haloed youth, a divinely chosen prefiguration of Christ, according to the verses praising him on the facing page. What's surely significant here is the treatment of his garment, whose folds are articulated by a gold linear pattern, a motif that marks David as specially favored by the Lord. Gold pattern drapery is a rare phenomenon in the Carolingian era. era. but it's a hallmark of the work of the French Renaissance painter Jean Bourdichon, whose Pentecost miniature we see here again. And here 
from the same dismembered late 15th century book of hours is the beautiful miniature that's included in the exhibition, The Virgin Mary of the Annunciation, meditating over her reading as the Holy Spirit flies in from the upper left. Bourdichon has melded soft, natural flesh with supernatural drapery in a kind of pictorial magic only possible via the art of the illuminator. Now, we're going to leave the illuminated pages of manuscripts to consider the use of gold in their covers. Very, very few original book covers have survived from the Middle Ages or even the Renaissance, especially those of the kind known as treasure bindings, composed of, pre of precious metal, ivory, enamel, and inset jewels. Such bindings were fit materially and conceptually for the deity and for kings and queens. Here's an example from the exhibition, uh, the partially 12th century binding of a German gospel book intended to rest on the altar, a case of such reverence for the word of God that a manuscript whose text was written 100 years earlier was covered with this splendid new binding of gold, rock crystal, and colored enamels surrounding a golden relief of Christ, crowned, blessing, and holding a golden book. Oh. <clears throat> and here is one of the stars of the gold exhibition, a tiny book truly fit for a queen to wear on her belt, even though uh, L.A. Jackson, one of the show's curators, has now discovered that this so-called Psalter of Queen Anne Boleyn was probably not really hers, but belonged to another 16th century lady. And those of you who've seen the show will remember the minuscule size uh, and skilled factor of this amazing golden book. I'm going to end this talk as I began with images of books, the golden books of my title. As you've heard from Kathleen Doyle when she introduced me, the theme of my book, Penned and Painted, is images of books in books, that is, representations of books in medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. Among the examples that I discussed were several where books themselves were depicted as golden, either with gold bindings, gold foredges, or gold script. Well, that. <clears throat> We've already seen this miniature of the evangelist John from an 11th century gospel book from Cologne. Uh, and now here, yes, uh, here's a page from the, uh, from the 12th century Melisende Psalter, um, uh, whose Psalm 1 initial we've also seen. This miniature shows Christ enthroned between the Virgin Mary and St. John the Baptist. As himself the Word of God, Christ holds a richly jeweled golden book that contains the Word of God. Yes, and finally, here's a page from the late 10th century book of Episcopal Blessings, the benedictional of the saintly Anglo-Saxon Bishop Ethelwald uh, that really sums it all up. The golden haloed Christian Lord in the golden initial O um, of the abbreviation for omnipotens, almighty, identified in golden script below as the Trinity, quote, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, framed in a pointed golden arch of heaven, seated on a golden ark of earth, wearing a golden garment and holding a golden book. This is a resplendent example of the painted image of the book as a symbol of the sacred. And for me, it's the ideal picture with which to end this talk. Thank you.
Thank you, Lucy, for a really stimulating and thought-provoking lecture, which I'm sure will have stimulated questions, uh, both here in the audience, and just to remind you, if you haven't submitted a question online, there's a question box uh, just below the video, and uh, my colleague, uh, Joan, is going to be reading out uh, any questions that, um, that you have from the, our online audience. So, to, if I may start in the room, um, is there anyone who has a question uh, for Lucy? Uh, I see a hand just here in the back. Would the Quran have um, miniatures and golden inscriptions? So, the question was whether a Quran would also have um, in golden inscriptions. No, the Quran, the, the Quran is the, the 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 sacred book of Islam, and uh, uh, figural images are prohibited prohibited uh, in uh, uh, Islam. Uh, there, are, Qurans, however, were uh, uh, written in gold script, and there's an example in the in the exhibition. So a great deal of devotion was uh, attention, uh, devoted attention was paid to the calligraphy itself, the sacred, the sacred text, and Qurans are often uh, often have beautiful decorated borders, uh, decorated with gold as well, but no figural, no figural imagery. Wait, wait for the microphone and then. Would I be correct in saying that gold is sometimes associated with wisdom? Yes, so, and, I, and, and I think that the picture from the Dante manuscript that I showed is a sort of example of that because the gold sun, which is the emblem of God, is beaming down, beaming down and it represents the wisdom of God that's transmitted to uh, humankind. I think we have a question from our online audience that Joan is going to read out. Hey, yeah, we've got a question here from Catherine Reynolds. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Do you have any sense of how much a book like the Golden Gospels would have been used for its text, or was part of its function to glorify the Word of God simply through its creation and existence? Well, it's a, let's say it's a ceremonial benedictional. Uh, there's always a question of, 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 uh, in relation to these uh, very, uh, very precious manuscripts so full of gold. Uh, particularly, I think it's uh, a question in relation to gospel books. Were they actually used or were they there as sacred objects to rest on the altar. Now, a benedictional contains these episcopal blessings. I think that maybe even a bishop would probably have had to read from some text if he actually performed these ceremonies, but I don't think that, uh, that, that Ethelwald ever actually had to use this book to perform any, benedict any, any of his episcopal blessings. Maybe I can, while, you're, it's, it's, while we're waiting, if anybody else has anything to add. Could I, you've, you've looked at a lot of images to select these and to choose them for your book. What's, what was the most surprising discovery you made in this process after looking at probably thousands of manuscripts in your career? Oh. Oh, that's a very hard question. That's a that's a very <laughs> challenging. It's a very well. It's a very challenging question. I, I when I was working on the book, it was like a surprise a day. I mean, I started by, I started before COVID, um, and uh, uh, and then COVID happened. And thanks to the wonderful digital resources of the British Library, I was able to compile a list of books in books. It mounted to about 180 examples, um, and then I, I, I siphoned them, I, uh, I broke them down. Uh, but as I, 
I mean, I was attracted, of course, by the fact that there was a book in the picture. But then as I began to look at them, for every, every, almost every manuscript, I just had a kind of surprise. It was some, because, because they were pictures in manuscripts, many of them had been written about, but they hadn't been, but the representation of books in those books hadn't been written about. And so, you know, just to shift your focus a bit, uh, enables you to have this wonderful exhilaration of seeing something new in the picture. I can't be more specific. No, no, I would. <laughs> it sounds like it, you had some fun in, in yeah. actually yes. doing, doing the work. I think there's another question online. The, yeah, another qu online question, this time from Brigitte. Um, she is actually gilding while listening to you. Could you please tell me the technical name for gold back backgrounds? I heard it once at a Society of Gilders conference in 2019, and I've been trying to remember it ever since. I, I don't know. Um, as I said, I, I, I listened here the other night at the British Library to Patricia Lovett, uh, who, is an, who is an expert calligrapher, and she talked about the application of gold. I'm not a, a craftsperson myself, and I and I and I know very little actually about the tech about the the technique. You can learn quite a lot, I think, from the exhibition itself. But I don't know whether you'll learn the name that was used in the Middle Ages for gold backgrounds. I mean, the general name for gold is aurum, but. Uh, I think there's a, a question just here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this was a really wide-ranging talk that took us through such different meanings for the presence of gold. Um, made me wonder whether there might be some cases where you would hesitate between assigning different meanings to the gold, or whether there might even be more than one meaning deliberately evoked by the gold in a particular case? There might be more than one meaning. Well, I think that uh, uh, multiple meanings are, uh, multiple meanings are not only, I th not only uh, the result of our, our distanced view, but I think they're inherent in the work in the design uh, and, the, and the execution of w the works themselves at the time. I mean, sometime, sometimes, I mean, sometimes images are the results of very complex thinking on the part of the people who designed them and executed them. One more question in the back, perhaps. Thank you, Professor, for a really interesting talk. Uh, lecture. Um, just carrying on from your thought on uh, what you said about the um, the bishop's book, uh, Ethelwald, was it? Ethelwald. Ethelwald, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, you said you didn't think that he would have used that book. Um, do you have reason to, to think that, or is it more of an impression from maybe the, the good state of it, and yeah, it's, have you written about it? Well, I haven't, uh, I'm not the person who's written, <laughs> I, I mean, I have, I've skipped over, it's, it, one could, could not say that I've written in depth about the benediction of St. Ethelwald. I don't, I, 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 I think my impression that it wasn't actually, I mean, it wasn't actually used in the actual ceremonies uh, uh, that the text contains, uh, that's, the, that's because of the, of the character of the book, of, the, of this particular book. Uh, but the relation to Ethelwald uh, is very certain. Great. I think we have a, maybe we'll have one last question from the online audience. And, uh... Uh, so this question is from Rosemary. She thanks you for an amazing lecture. Why do you think that these types of golden books fell out of favor on, fell out of favor later and 
um, and in more recent centuries? Why did they fall out of favor? Well, uh, it's the advent, I suppose it's the advent of printing and the inexpensive, I mean, printing, printed books at first were very, expen were very expensive and sometimes they were decorated by hand and sometimes the initials were gold and the borders were filled with gold. Uh, but as printed books really took over, I suppose we're in a situation of some kind of technological change now. Um, uh, but in, in, in at some point by 1600, printed books more or less replaced manuscripts. And even the one that I, uh, the, uh, the, the one with the wonderful borders with the flowers and the insects and uh, it's a, um, uh, that was made at a time when books of that sort were really for connoisseurs. Uh, and I think by that time, a book of ours for daily use, even by the devout, would have been a print, would, would have been a printed book. Well, thank you all for thank you all for coming to tonight's event, either here in person or by watching online. And I hope that you've enjoyed it uh, as much as I have. And from the comments we've heard, it seems that that is the case. We'd welcome your feedback. If you're watching online, you can uh, add some feedback by using the menu um, just above the video to do this or to make a donation. And although our online audience won't be able to join us for the book signing um, in just a few minutes, if you'd like to get a copy of Penned and Paint Painted, or indeed the uh, little exhibition highlights book, Gold, you can use the book tab on the screen to do that. And we'd also love to welcome you back to the British Library for more exhibitions, lectures, conversations, and performances. So keep an eye on the What's uh, On pages of our website for that information. And you can also watch any past events in this series or in other series and see a 20-minute highlights video about the exhibition on the British Library player. And do make a note in your diaries of the library's next major manuscript exhibition, Alexander the Great, The Making of a Myth, which opens on the 22nd of October. So thank you so much for joining us, and please join me in thanking Lucy once again for a really wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.